Oh, hi. Welcome. I am so glad that you could make it uh, to join us today on Christmas Eve. I do want to start off by letting you know that everything you saw was a fiction. Actually, just everything as it relates to me. I don't wear a tie or a sweater for that matter at home uh, unless <laughs> I have to. Uh, and I'm certainly not involved in the cooking of food. In our family, uh, the food supply chain ends with my mouth and I'm not, I don't intervene uh, anywhere before that. Merry Christmas. We're John and Brandy Parker. Thank you so much for joining us and for joining us um, for Summit Worship tonight and Christmas Eve. We'd like to take a special welcome to those of you who are worshiping in your homes with your family and especially to you kids who are in the audience today. Speaking of kids, I bet you guys are excited for some fun Christmas traditions that'll happen in the next day. One of our favorite family traditions is, I thought I'd tell you about it, is the Polar Express. Well, it used to be a lot more popular when they were little, and then they didn't like it, and now they really like it again. But every year, um, at about bedtime, John goes out and decorates our big 12-passenger creepy van um, with Christmas lights. Which actually looks even more creepy with lights on it <laughs> than it does on it. Yeah, it's great. So he goes out and decorates it, and I print tickets that say Polar Express Ride. And um, John goes out by the front of the van and starts yelling, all aboard, all aboard. And I hand out tickets and cups of hot cocoa. And we all go out to the decorated van and drive around town and look at Christmas lights and listen to loud Christmas music and be generally ruckus and have a great time. That's right. That's the one uh, Parker family Christmas tradition that has stood uh, the test of time. For our church, uh, there is a tradition that has also stood the test of time and is really uh, one of the most beloved and exciting things uh, that we get to do. And that is uh, in the gifting of the Christmas Eve offering. So every year when we, uh, when we are preparing for the Christmas Eve services and Advent and the celebration of Jesus' birth, uh, we also work really hard uh, to figure out where's a partnership, an organization, an opportunity uh, to give uh, that is exciting, that is that is uh, that is relevant to, to the context that we're in, uh, and is something that we would be deeply passionate about giving to. And then we collect an offering in this service, and we give it in its entirety uh, to the work of the organization uh, that we're partnering with. This year, I'm excited to let you know uh, that the recipient of Summit's Christmas Eve offering uh, will be United Against Poverty, or more commonly known as Up Orlando. They work uh, with the working poor uh, in, uh, in our city, and in a year where their financial contributions have been lower and the need has been much greater, uh, we feel like it's a critical and important opportunity uh, for us as the church uh, to stand uh, with our community in a time and season of need. So to learn more about the mission of Up Orlando and how the offering will be used, join me in watching this. I think sometimes our name, if you say the full name of our organization, United Against Poverty, can be a little misleading, not in our, what we're trying to achieve, but in who the people are we serve. Don't think poverty and get all hung up in that, because I think some people equate the word poverty with negativity. Poverty can be a temporary status. It's not something that defines you as a person. At Up Orlando, we primarily serve people that are classified as what we call the working poor. This means they have a job um, and they just can't make ends meet on their low wages because the cost of living is, is ex exorbitant. We have got to do something right now in this crisis in particular to help and assist our neighbors in need. We can't always count on the federal government to help us out, or even the local government. And so that's why organizations like ours here at Up Orlando have been around. When we go back to the inception of, of our campus, which it started in 2001 under, it was called the Destiny Foundation. And even back then, it, it, the mission of Destiny Foundation was, it started as food and low cost food. But what 
was determined was people that are in need of low-cost food are usually in need of something else as well. So that's where I think the other programs through the years have, have come into existence. And it's, it's, the goal is having all of the services lift the people to economic self-sufficiency. Our belief here at United Against Poverty is giving a hand up, not a hand out. And we do that through our programs, our low-cost grocery program, our workforce development program, our education program, as well as our crisis stabilization program. One of the ways that we help people in, in our crisis stabilization program is we have our doors open Monday to Friday, nine to four. They can come in any time uh, to let us know what they need. We have um, access to a computer lab where they can look for jobs, they can surf the net, they can email with friends and relatives. They also can meet with our crisis navigator to come up with a success plan. And then of course our grocery, which helps people with low cost groceries, uh, with about 70% off of the traditional grocery stores around. And then our workforce development program, which we call Success Training Employment Program, that helps people with uh, 120 hours of coursework to help them with emotional intelligence, to help them gain employment and do well in their employment as well as move up. And then we have our um, education program, which right now we partner currently with Orange Technical College to help people with getting their GED and other certifications. We also partner with Valencia College uh, with our, currently on our campus, the Warehouse Logistics Certification Program. With all of our programs, we have a lot of strategic planning that goes into place to help, and um, we've seen a lot of success with that. People go through our program and end up in great places. Success for us comes in many forms. It's when people graduate from our workforce development program with a job, and then they no longer eventually, after a year or so when they've made it and they're financially stable and they no longer need us, that's huge success. Success is when a family uses our grocery program temporarily while they're in a little bit of a crunch and they, once again, no longer need us. But success can be um, just helping someone who is on a fixed income to every month make it through their monthly bills and be able to pay their other um, obligations and stay with us forever. There's lots of different ways to look at success here. We're, we're, we're meeting people where they are and um, success is moving them along their journey. We need financial support. We need volunteers. Uh, our volunteer numbers have dropped with COVID. There's always something, mostly your prayers, your word of mouth, telling people out in the community that we're here. When you find someone in need, tell them about us. Tell them to come to Up Orlando and see how we can help them. The gift from Summit will be such a blessing to us. Um, this year in particular with COVID, um, donations have not been the same. Our organization, it's about keeping the doors open. It's about being here when, and all of us making it to the other side of this crisis we're in so that we can continue to be here and serve. Um, and there's so much that goes into serving all of these different programs. It's the roof repairs, it's the air conditioning, it's the <laughs> freezer repairs, it's the, there's so much. So your donations will be doing so much. And, and also all of those, those items help us to provide a service to our neighbors in need that is dignified. We are here every day to assist our neighbors in need and to help them lift themselves to economic self-sufficiency and to do that with dignity, respect, compassion, love, partnership, 
and we do that with wonderful organizations like your church. We appreciate you. I'm about to cry. <laughs> I mean that. I mean, we can't do it alone. We can't. So here's how you can give. First of all, if you're a guest with us in a normal week, uh, we would say no one invited you here for your money, which is true today, uh, and we'd ask you not to give. Today, we would actually ask you to give. We'd ask everyone who's participating in the service uh, to consider giving uh, to, to the work of Up Orlando and, uh, and to the Christmas Eve offering. You can, you can give uh, to Summit. We'll collect it all, and then we'll give it all in one lump sum uh, to Up Orlando. So you can text uh, 45888 uh, to, to give uh, by text, or you can follow uh, the link on our website uh, to the giving portal however you give, uh, know that we are grateful uh, for your participation in this. If you're intending to give your, uh, your end of your giving or your regular tithe and offering in the service, you just need to designate it that because anything, uh, unless it's otherwise designated, goes to the Christmas Eve offering. So if you're giving, again, towards Summit's regular budget, thank you for that. Uh, and, uh, and just make sure that it's properly noticed that we can direct your contribution in the way intended. Thank you so much in advance for giving. We invite you to join us in worship as we worship a God who gives us a reason to rejoice. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. Rocks, hills, and plains Repeat the sounding joy Repeat the sounding joy Repeat, repeat the sounding joy of his love and wonders, wonders of his love.
In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he was from the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were also shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid for I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. I love good news. I'm an Enneagram 7. I live for good news. And in a year where there's been some really bad news, I found myself even wanting to celebrate mediocre news, like Knight Riders getting rebooted, you know? I mean, it's not good news, but, you know, okay. But in this year of really bad news, there's also been some really good news. A year ago, around this time, two little girls were born, Vivian and Margot, to Laura and Jared. They were born at just 22 weeks and they weren't expected to make it to their first Christmas. And they're about to celebrate their second Christmas. That's really good news. In a year where this pandemic has caused us as a church, to spend most of the year doing services online, we still had 27 people make the choice to get baptized at Bethune Beach back in October. That's really good news. Dave, who met with me for coffee just a couple months ago because he was all stressed out because he had lost his job and he didn't know what he was gonna do, how he was gonna provide for himself and his family during this time, just a couple weeks ago, told me that he now has a job that he loves way better than his old job. That's really good news. In a year of social distancing, still over 300 of you, 300 of you who call some at home came around and, 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 and supported and surrounded foster care families. That's really good news. I had a plumbing issue that I thought was gonna cost me a couple thousand dollars and it only cost a couple hundred dollars. That's really good news. Jake and Asha, who for a long time wanted to have a child, adopted their first boy, John P. the third this year. That's some really good news. What's some good news you've gotten this year? I know there's been a lot of bad news, but I bet if you think about it, even if you got a lot of really bad news, I bet you can think of some good news. Christianity is supposed to be good news because it is. And my guess is if you are here, if you're tuning into this and you aren't a Christian, first of all, I'm so glad. I'm so glad that you're watching this. I'm so glad that you're taking part in this. But my guess is if you are a, aren't a Christian and you hear the word Christianity, the first thing that comes to mind isn't good news. It might be, 
uh, Christianity is about being nice. Christianity is about the golden rule, doing to others as you would have them do to you. Christianity is about serving the poor. Christianity is about going to church, following the rules, being religious. And that's if you have a favorable view of Christianity. I know for some of you, you've been really hurt by the church or by Christians. And so when I say the word Christianity to you, you might think closed-minded, bigoted, judgmental. Maybe to you, Christianity is politics. It's just about gaining power. Christianity is about passing on or enforcing an archaic morality on everyone, getting in everyone's business. But if you were to ask an angel, if you were to ask an angel, and that seems fitting on a day when we celebrate the birth of Jesus, if you were to ask an angel, what is Christianity? You would hear them say, do not be afraid, for I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Christianity is supposed to be good news because it is. It's good news that silences our fears and inflicts joy. Did you hear it? The angel said, fear not, don't be afraid. I give you good news that will cause, that will inflict joy to all. Christianity is fear silencing, joy inflicting good news. Now, if I were a betting man, and that only happens when the lotto gets up to a billion dollars because even God's like, yeah, might as well try, you know. Uh, but if I were a betting man, I would say, if you aren't a Christian, you were not thinking good news when I said the word Christianity. But the truth is, even if you are a Christian, that's probably not the first thing that came to mind. But y'all, that is the answer. That's the only right answer. Christianity is fear silencing, joy inflicting, good news. I told you all at the beginning of this pandemic, actually in the very first uh, service where we moved everything online, um, that I was struggling with anxiety, that I'd never struggled with anxiety really in my life. Um, and, and even when I told you all that back in March, I thought it would be a passing thing. I thought it was probably more based on circumstances that I would be able to figure out how to get myself out of it, that it'd be a passing thing. But over the last nine months, it's only gotten worse. And on top of that, I've been walking around with this low-grade depression. It's been hard to focus at work. It's been hard uh, to be present with my wife and my kids. Uh, some mornings, it's really hard to just get out of bed. Um, so I'm on medicine for the first time in my life, uh, and I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm fearful that I'll have to be on medicine for the rest of my life just to feel normal again. I'm also fearful, not just that I will never feel normal again, but that we will never be normal again. That our way of connecting to each other has been forever altered by this socially distance, uh, this keep everyone at an arm's length apart kind of way. No more hugs and mask. Smiling's my favorite. I'm fearful that things will never go back to the way they were. I'm fearful also that we've said too many hurtful things about people who look or think or voted differently than us. We've said too many hurtful things that even amongst fellow believers, it might be beyond repair. And listen, here's the thing. If it's all on me, if it's up to me, I should be fearful. <laughs> I, I, I can't fix all that on my own, and neither can you. What, what are some of the things that you're fearful of? Are you fearful uh, that maybe you'll never meet someone who really loves you, that will stay with you no matter what? Are you fearful about how your kids are turning out, fearful that you'll have kids? Are you fearful that you'll be stuck in a job that you hate for the rest of your life, that you'll always have to live paycheck to paycheck? Are you fearful that she'll leave or they'll find out? What are you fearful about? The angel said, don't be afraid. How can the angel say that? Because Christianity is fear silencing, joy inflicting good news. Every other religion starts with you. 
and what you need to do to fix it. And, and it's a teaching or a philosophy, a pathway to God or enlightenment or a better you, a you with a six pack. Thank God that is not what Christianity is. Christianity is good news. Yes, Christianity has teaching, really wise teaching, practical teaching, but it's not primarily a teaching. Yes, Christianity has a philosophy of life, a, 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 a beautiful philosophy of life, but it's not a philosophy. And yes, Christianity can point you towards a better you, but it's not about a better you. Christianity is not about a pathway to God, but about a God who made a pathway to you. That's what we're celebrating at Christmas. We didn't work our way up to him. At Christmas, he came down to us. That's fear silencing, joy inflicting good news. At Christmas, the angels heralded, something has happened that will change everything. The angel didn't say, good news, a penny saved is a penny earned. Or good news, be true to yourself. Or good news, a worm is the only animal that can't fall down. No, that's good advice. That's not news. And that's probably the biggest misconception about Christianity to both non-Christians and Christians is that Christianity is good advice. No one knew this better than the apostle Peter. Peter was a man, a poor fisherman who met Jesus and it changed everything for him. In fact, he even his name was changed. His name was Simon and, Peter, and, and Jesus said, no, Peter, you'll now be Peter, the rock. And Peter was the first one who realized the good news. He was the first one who looked at Jesus and said, you're it, you're the savior, you're the Messiah. And Jesus looked back at him and said, and you're the rock. You're the one that I'm gonna build my entire church on. But y'all, Peter was a mess. He got things wrong all the time. He was impulsive sometimes, he was judgmental. And maybe worst of all, at Jesus's greatest hour of need, he turned his back on him. As Jesus was being led to the cross, Peter denied even knowing him. And yet, Jesus still chose Peter. Peter was still the rock on which the church was built. After Jesus' resurrection from the dead, he looked at Peter and he said, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Essentially, he said to him, I still choose you. I'm still gonna use you. Why could Jesus do that? Why could Jesus build his church through a screw up like Peter? Because Christianity isn't about us and what we can do for Jesus. It's about what Jesus has done for us, period. It's good news. It's not good advice. And Peter saw this good news play out in real time. He saw Jesus live the life you and I and he was designed to live perfectly. And he saw Jesus die the death we deserve on the cross. And he also saw the resurrection from the grave where he found out forever that there has been a defeat of sin and death. That is good news. And Peter, towards the end of his life, and he wouldn't live much longer than Jesus. In fact, he would die in a very similar manner by crucifixion. Some say that he was crucified upside down because he said, I can't be crucified in the same way as my savior. But he would write a letter to the church before his death. And he would write to a bunch of people who had never seen Jesus face to face and people who were struggling, people who were suffering, people who were being persecuted because they were choosing to follow Jesus. And he would write these words, though you have not seen him, Jesus, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. That's 1 Peter 1, 8. Let me tell you something. If Jesus is not our savior, but our example, if Jesus is good advice on how to live your life, you will not be filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. You will be filled with guilt and shame and dread. If, if Jesus is simply our example to follow, Jesus is the worst news ever. If you read through the gospels and uh, when asked about Jesus, Albert Einstein said, I'm a Jew, but I'm enthralled by the luminous figure of the Nazarene. No man can read the gospels without feeling the actual presence of Jesus. His personality pulsates in every word. No myth 
is filled with such life. But if you read the Gospels, you see a perfect life lived, a life characterized by putting the needs of others above oneself, a life dedicated to healing and forgiveness, 70 times seven if that's what it takes, a life where nobody felt unseen or unloved, a life where the golden rule was never broken, not once. Almost every religion has some form of the golden rule. And if Jesus simply came and he came to be our example and he said to us, live like me, obey the golden rule, that's not good news. It's good advice and it's crushing. Look around. No one disagrees with the golden rule and that that's a better way to live. And yet, it doesn't work. Check Facebook, watch the news, examine yourself. If we all followed the golden rule, there would be no need for Up Orlando. There would be no child that was unwanted or uncared for. Everyone, no matter their race or their gender or their ethnicity, would ever feel unseen or unheard or unloved. The golden rule is a good idea, but it's not good news. The other day, after one of our worship services, a woman and her husband came up to me for prayer. And the woman had made a choice, um, a choice that has ended many marriages, uh, but it hadn't ended theirs. She's married to a man who really understands his need for grace and forgiveness. And so he's choosing to show his wife grace and forgiveness. But they came up and asked for prayer because the wife just, even though she's been forgiven, even though her husband tells her he loves her and that he doesn't see her by her mistake. She says, I can't escape feeling shame and guilt. And I just, I just, it, it weighs so heavily on me. And she said, and I'm not really good at reading the Bible, but I started reading the Bible in hopes that that would set me free. And she said, I started with the Sermon on the Mount. And she said, and I got to that part where it said, um, you know, you have been told not to commit adultery. But what I tell you is this, Anyone who looks at someone with lust has committed adultery. And then with tears in her eyes, she just said, I'll never be free from my guilt and my shame. And I said, you can read it that way. And many people do. But don't you see what Jesus was doing? Don't you see that Jesus was leveling the playing field? That what Jesus said out of the three of us standing right here, none of us could cast the first stone. We were all guilty. The purpose of the Sermon on the Mount and the purpose of every bit of the Bible, every law, every story, all of it is meant to point us towards good news, to abolish any notion that we can do it on our own, that we can fix it by ourselves. My counselor often says it's crazy that we believe we can fix ourselves with the very self that got us into trouble in the first place. Christianity isn't about fixing yourself. We can't do it, but that's okay because Jesus came for us. Why? Because he loved us. One of the most famous verses in the Bible, John three sixteen: for God so loved us that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God gives, he doesn't take. Because he loves us, he gave. This is really good news. This is fear silencing, joy inflicting good news. Think about it. If, if one of your greatest fears is rejection or failure, because Jesus came, and succeeded for you, you can fail. You can lose. Behold what manner of love the Father has lavished on us that we might be called children of God. And that is what we are. You are a dearly loved child of God and no one's opinion of you will change who you really are. Christianity is fear silencing, joy inflicting good news. If you fear the future, you know what? because God did not withhold his only son from you. You can trust and obey him even in the bleakest of circumstances. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns and yet your heavenly father feeds them. 
are you not so much more valuable to him than they are? Christianity is fear-silencing, joy-inflicting good news. If you fear death, because Jesus came, because Jesus came and he died for you, you will live with him for all eternity. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? And when we see him face to face, we're told that every tear will be wiped from every face. And, and you know what that means? It means that somehow everything that went wrong, somehow every sin that we committed, every sin done against us, all of a sudden it will make sense. And in fact, we will see that it is greater that we were once lost and broken. Christianity is fear silencing, joy inflicting news. If you fear needing to be on medicine for the rest of your earthly life, because Jesus came and was strong for me, I am free to be weak. I am a dearly loved child of God, and I know that we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, and that he who began a good work in me will complete it. Christianity is fear silencing, joy inflicting good news. I've got one last story for you. It's a story about my wife. And I've known my wife since we were 10, so there's not very many stories that I wasn't there for. Uh, but I love it when I get to hear stories that I didn't know, that I wasn't there for. And there's this story uh, of her when she was four. And her and her big sister got to be in the church nativity play. And she was so mad that she had to be a dirty old shepherd while her sister got to be a perfect angel. And you can see this picture of her reaction to that news. She said, she declared boldly, I, why do I have to be a dirty old shepherd? I want to be a perfect angel like Kara. Going back to Peter's letter to the church, after he he says all that about being filled with inexpressible and, and glorious joy because we see who Jesus is and we know who he is and we know what he's done. And when we understand the Bible is not an instruction manual, but a love letter of a God who keeps coming after us, who keeps coming after us to melt our heart with Jesus Christ, with the good news that Jesus came and died and resurrected from the dead. Peter then says, even angels long to look into these things. That's 1 Peter 1.12. He's talking about the good news, the gospel. Why would angels long to look at the gospel? The gospel's not for them. God didn't come down to earth to save angels, but to save us. Jesus, as it says in Philippians, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used to his own advantage, but rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in the appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus didn't do that out of his love for angels. He did that out of his love for us for you. And Peter, when he says this, he uses the word long. It's a, it's a Greek word that actually means obsession. And he, and he says the present tense, even the angels long to look into these things. He's not saying back then the angels long to look. He's saying they are still looking. They keep looking at it. They are obsessing over it, longing for it to play out. When Jesus tells the story about that lost sheep being found by the shepherd or the prodigal son making his way home to the loving father, Jesus says, there is more rejoicing in heaven when someone who is lost is found, when someone comes home. He says, there is the greatest, biggest blowout party every time someone hears and believes the good news. Even now, the angels are peering down, hoping, longing. What my wife at four years old didn't realize is that it's way better to be a dirty old shepherd than to be a perfect angel. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you uh, just for your love for us that you indeed loved us enough that you would send your one and only son. 
thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for identifying with your creation in such a personal and intimate way. And thank you for making Christianity good news and not good advice. That we can be set free by what Jesus has done. And Father, if there's anyone participating in this service who has never felt the freedom that comes with believing the good news, would you, by your spirit, keep speaking, wooing their hearts to surrender? And for those of us who have known this story, who have believed the good news for a long time, may you ignite in us a passion to live it out and to share it, just like those shepherds did on that Christmas night. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you uh, for being a part of this Christmas Eve service and for uh, letting us be a part of your family tradition. It's been honor an honor uh, to spend this time with you and we wish you the very merriest of Christmases. If you weren't able to give to the Christmas Eve offering, uh, you can still do so. Just follow the instructions uh, as noted. And we're grateful again um, for your participation in that, our richest summit Christmas uh, tradition. Now, as we close our time together, hear these words of benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in God's peace and Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.